So uh, welcome everybody to my uh, presentation, geophysics-based soil mapping for improved simulation of uh, crop productivity. This is actually a work from a PC student who worked with me in the Transregional Trans 32 project, Cosimo Brocchi, but uh, since this is the starting point of the Open Call 2 project that was uh, kindly funded by the by Venorop, I, I thought I would take this opportunity to inform you about uh, preliminary work that inspired the, the, the project that I will be doing in Venorop. So, got help from a lot of people shown on this slide and uh, some of them like Michael Herbst, Lutz Weiermöller, Karsten Monska, and also Stefan Petzold from the University of Bonn and Harif Aiken are probably names you are very familiar with uh, also within the context of Venorop. So to motivate the work, I would like to start with uh, the yield gap. So I think uh, certainly in the years that this PhD was done, uh, Everybody was aware that drought is of increased importance for reduced crop performance in rain-fed agriculture. And uh, if we consider the yield potential of a particular site, shown here, let me get the pointer, yield potential. So if all management and also water availability is perfect, then uh, we can maybe achieve 100% uh, of the yield. We can, or we can dream about this. And uh, in, if, if in a given year water is limited, this may be leads to the water limited yield potential. And then this leads to this gap between uh, what can potentially be achieved and what can be achieved given the weather conditions. But this yield gap does not only depend on the atmospheric conditions, but it also very much depends on the soil characteristics. So if we wanted to, if we want to tackle this yield gap, we need an accurate soil description. And in this presentation, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about this soil characterization. I will not be talking about nutrient availability, pests, diseases, and weeds, which all contribute to additional yield gaps. So if you think about accurate soil descriptions, then I uh, think everybody knows what to do if, if, if we are considering a single, very small plot, a few square me meters, we typically rely on uh, a soil profile description and uh, then we get, this will allow us to get sufficient information about soil properties. But if we think about large scale, uh, describing soil patterns at the larger scale, and um, then we, we, we find or that general purpose maps like the soil maps or the Reichsbodenschätzung uh, are typically not detailed enough to capture the small scale variability in soil characteristics and the start and this then leads to to problems describing soil variability at the field scale perhaps but certainly at the at the intermediate one square kilometer scale and the starting point of this uh, work was uh, the question whether uh, geophysics based soil mapping can help to fill this gap and Particularly, we were interested in investigating what is the added value of geophysical mapping for hydrological and agroecosystem modeling, precision agriculture, for example, the definition of management zones, and ideally also for yield prediction. So, if you think about geophysical measurement techniques that are available, then uh, then these three methods, ERT, GPR, and EMI, typically uh, come to mind first in an agricultural context and actually we're all, all these three methods are being applied uh, in Venerop. But in this, these, in this presentation and, and also in the Open Call 2 project, I will be focusing on electromagnetic induction, EMI. And why, uh, and why is this? And this is because it's a highly mobile measurement. You can operate it on a measurement platform like shown here in the, in the slide. And um, there even is the potential for making contactless measurements in the presence of crop. So this is an in interesting geophysical met measurements to go to even uh, larger scales. So the, 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 me the measurement pr principle of, of electromagnetic induction is not 100% uh, straightforward. Try to illustrate this uh, with this uh, slide. So but the idea is that we have two coils uh, that generate a 
uh, transmitter coil that then generates a, generates a primary magnetic field by running an alternated, alternating current through the coil. And this induces very small electrical currents in the soil because the ground is slightly conductance. And these currents then generate a secondary magnetic field that we detect with a second coil. And the superpositioning of these electromagnetic fields at the second coil can be shown that this is directly related to the, to the electrical conductivity of the subsurface. And the electrical conductivity of the subsurface is, 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 um, is not an easy parameter and it is influenced by a range of factors such as texture, layering, water content, temperature, and, and, and perhaps even some additional factors. But it is a proxy that nevertheless is interesting to investigate. Now, the interesting thing about uh, EMI is that recently or in the past decade, let's say modern multi-configuration instruments have become available available where the coils are positioned in different ways. So we can change the orientation of the coils and we can also change the separation between the coils. This is kind of illustrated in this uh, figure here. And this leads to measurements that sense the soil uh, over different depths. Huh? If the coils are close together, we, we get the information about the electrical conductivity of the shallow subsurface. And if the coils are farther away, we get information about uh, deeper parts in the soil. And uh, the idea is now to use a, a quad uh, or, a, uh, or some, some other vehicle to pull a system with multiple configurations through the field. And this then allows to map a, uh, an area of one hectare in approximately one hour. This and, and the data that we obtain is a high resolution in line. The resolution is about 30 centimeters. And, and in this particular study, we made a measurement line every two and a half meters. So this is the out of line um, resolution. As you can see here in the lower right uh, picture, the only thing that you have to do during the data acquisition is to concentrate and don't make an accident uh, while driving uh, through the agricultural fields. Okay, and we applied this method for a one square kilometer study area uh, in the Silhausen region. This, is, uh, this was one of the focus regions of the Trans-Regional 32, south of the Forschungszentrum Jülich. And this area is characterized by heterogeneous soils that affect crop development uh, uh, when water is uh, limited. And if you only look at uh, aerial photos of the area, we can all, we can, all, we can already see these uh, interesting patterns in the, in the sugar beet fields that are growing here. And so there's the, 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 the green areas indicate plants that are growing better and the, the light green areas uh, in the same field indicate areas where, <coughs> in this case, sugar beet is growing less uh, prolific. Ever since this PhD, I see these patterns everywhere if, if I'm sitting in a plane. I didn't do it much last two years, but uh, it's fascinating. Yeah? So often you see these patterns of soil heterogeneity effect, affecting uh, crop pro productivity. And even for this one square kilometer, the most detailed available soil ma ma maps do not reproduce these, uh, do not reproduce this soil heterogeneity. It's not reflected in soil maps. So we mapped this area uh, with a multi-configuration EMI setup as shown in this image. And every field was visited, not at the same time, because this is, uh, there are, I don't, I, I think there are 12 farmers and 32 fields or something like this. So it was a logistic uh, challenge to measure all these fields. Uh, but um, after they, after a summer of data acquisition in this uh, particular experiment, all fields were measured, and uh, what I ju what just flashed by are our EMI measurements made with different coil separations, though kind of summarizing the subsurface, the average of the electrical conductivity for different depth levels. And of course, uh, problems arise 
if we acquire uh, data in this way, for example, here we see three fields that were measured at different times. And of course, the absolute values are, no, are now not comparable across field boundaries because there are factors that affect electrical conductivity, such as water content that are not stable in time. So if you measure different days, kind of the base level may be, left, may be different. But at the same time, we see that some that patterns are kind of continuous across the boundaries anyway, the patterns, not the absolute values. And then of course, there are other confounding factors such as uh, shown here. This was one field um, that was measured at the same time, but, were, but that had three different props growing uh, before our measurements, and we also see that the that the type of crop uh, uh, maybe maybe there was different management because they were managed by different farmers. So maybe there was different fertilization, or maybe the the, the accumulated water uptake during the grow, growing season was a little bit different. So also here we see value. So it is actually not so easy to interpret the quantitative values. And that's why in this study, we decided to take a, a different approach where we focused more on image classification. So uh, kind of um, borrowing very closely ideas from, from how remote sensing data are being interpreted. We interpreted our EMI data where we kind of merged these six different, six different depth levels of our EMI data into a multi-band raster, raster image. And then we use this uh, raster images to, uh, to, for image classification. So basically to identify areas with similar signatures, then suggesting areas with similar soil. So, and this was done using a supervised, supervised image classification technique. Uh, and, and then this resulted in a, a classified map representing different soil types within a field. And of course, th this is nice for one field, but the, 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 the very the, the special thing that we did in this study is that this was done for all fields. <coughs> so it was done field by field because of these um, confounding factors that I tried to introduce before. In the, in, in the end, we ended up with a, a supervised uh, classification that provides a high resolution, one meter resolution map of the area with, that is divided in four broad sub areas, A, B, C, and D, and a total of 18 soil classes. And if we compare it with, uh, with one of these uh, images from the field, you see here, this is the pattern in, uh, of the area that was non-stressed and we can recognize this pattern in our soil map. So the here for this particular case, there are two soil types that kind of capture the well, the, the sugar beets that are growing well, and two soil types in blue that are represent the areas where the, the, the sugar beets are not growing so well. And we also understand why, uh, where this is coming from. So uh, in this particular reason, we have a loss cover of variable thickness. So we have here Pleistocene sed sediments that are not good for the roots typically don't penetrate this. So if this surface is close to the surface, the, the plants are not growing well. And if, if we have these deeper areas, then there is enough available water for the crops to grow in the growing season. And this variable depth of, uh, of this uh, layer makes a good target for EMI. And this is why this works quite nicely in this area. So now in order to go from this nice colorful map to, to quantitative information, we decided uh, we sampled 100 locations within this one square kilometer. This is a, this sounds a lot, but this is comparable to the sampling resolution of a normal soil map. So at these locations, then we, did, we made a soil profile description and, and, and used these samples for textual analysis and all points within a soil class were averaged in order to obtain 18 soil profiles with a typical layering and a textual description, description um, um, like shown here. So the different colors here rep represent different soil layers. And for every soil layer, we have texture information. Um, 
So, and this now transforms uh, the, the map and makes it for me a, a soil map because we now have uh, profiles and areas. And, um, and, and this was a very nice, this was nice work. And if you're interested in more details, there is this Geoderma paper that you can uh, check, or of course, I'm happy to talk to you in more detail. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them later too. So the question now is next step, how can we use this soil map, map and, uh, and uh, yeah, valorize or exploit, exploit this map for, for um, yield predictions. And th that's why we decided to, to combine it with agro ecosystem modeling. modeling eh? Of course, the, the interesting now is that the soil map is one part of it, but of course the crop performance under water limited condi conditions will vary each year. So now coming back to the, this image of the first slide, now we're not talking about soil characteristics anymore, but now we are talking about uh, atmospheric conditions. So what we did is that we used this geophysics based soil maps and we combined it with the land use map for the year 2016, where uh, different crops were being grown in the area. And this then resulted in 80 unique soil crop combinations. So we had 18 soil types, I think five different crops, and some of the combinations were not present. And, and what we then did is for each of these 80 unique soil crop combinations, we set up our agro ecosystem model and um, and then we combined this with the meteorological information from 2016. In particular, we used precipitation, temperature, humidity, and solar radi radiation to drive our model. So this agro ecosystem model that we used is uh, is is called Agro C. It has uh, uh, many similar features as uh, Simplace, which is uh, I guess more widely used in uh, in Venerop. In particular, uh, it's a one-dimensional Richards equation is used for vertical, uh, the description of vertical water uh, transport and the uh, sucrose model is used for crop growth and organic matter accumulation rates. For this study, it's important to, to emphasize that, uh, that the simulated uh, uh, matrix potential or pressure head in the soil influences crop stress and, and, and if this occurs, then root water uptake and carbon assimilation and, and, and biomass increase is uh, reduced. So, so because we took these soil samples and, and we, uh, we acquired tech, soil textural information, we could also, we, we used pedo transfer functions. So like off the shelf pedo transfer functions to define the soil hydraulic pro properties for our soil layers. There was no fitting. We just used, we just used forward predictions of uh, soil hydraulic properties to, popu to populate our model, uh, with, with, uh, populate a model and to be able to run it for this one by one square kilometer areas. And it was very short. Uh, there, there were many dirty details there that we, if somebody's interested, we happy to discuss them. So then now let's look at some um, typical results. Here are two typical soil profiles from the areas. One has, uh, has a relatively shallow coarse sediments and a second profile does not have these coarse sediments. And what we see is that if we simulate an entire growing season, for sugar beet, I will be focusing on sugar beet in this presentation. Uh, we see that um, that in in this particular year, 2016, rain was uh, not abundant, and the crops were actually stressed, starting in July and 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 continuing deep into August and September, when the shallow uh, coarse sediments were present. But if if these coarse sediments were not present, the, 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 water hold, the water storage in the soil was sufficient to, to ensure uh, crop growth without stress. And of course, such stress periods then lead uh, to clear differences in uh, the leaf area index in these uh, simulations. 
So if you now look at these results at the field scale, uh, we, we, we kind of get the spatial image. So this was this is the same field that I was showing before with soil types and uh, again the, the pattern in sugar beet growth based on the photo here in dark in the background. This field had four different soil types that mainly varied in the depth to the coarse sediments. And if we then make simulations for these four soil classes, we see that we simulate diff pet differences in crop performance. And if we then average uh, independent uh, er estimates of leaf area index from satellite for these four areas, we see that our simulation kind of captures the, this decrease uh, in productivity for these four soil types. Here, this is more a, a spatial context. Now, if we, this is the, 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 if you want the reference LIE obtained from satellite information, this is the simulated pattern of LID, only four classes because we have these four soil classes. And, uh, and we, we see, and the visualization is not perfect, but we see the same patterns coming back. So the simulated LIE match well with the Olips with the observed patterns in uh, LIE from satellite data. Of course, we can then ex extend this to the kilometer scale and even uh, and even uh, you also use different crops. And uh, I typically don't focus too long on these slides because here, of course, the the the, the, visual, the visualization depends a lot on the on the timing and the phenology of the crops. Uh, some crops are winter crops, some crops are summer crops. And that's why these comparisons always kind of look nice uh, because basically the they just show whether something is growing on the field. But yes, also on the kilometer scale, uh, I think we capture the key patterns in uh, crop productivity. And this then allows us to, um, to also analyze, uh, for example, these weather limited uh, these yield caps due to water limitation. For example, this is a visualization then for the year 2016 in this middle region where these core sediments are not present, kind of 100% of the possible yield was achieved. But in these stressed areas uh, where the core sediment is much closer to the, uh, to the surface, the, the yield gap was up to 30, 40% depending on the, on the position in the field. Final step, I'm, I'm a little bit slow, sorry. Um, so, um, but the final step is then to see whether we make, we, we observe a difference with, uh, with standard soil maps. That was a question that we received a lot. So is there really, is there really a benefit of this geophysics compared to the, the standard soil maps that are available? And, and therefore we, compared the results for our map, the geophysics-based soil map with two maps that are available for this vision. One is this Reichsbodenschätzing, the soil taxation map. And the second one is the BUC. Uh, so this is a soil, ma soil map with a resolution of one to 5,000. And uh, we tried to treat this map fair and to derive a, uh, to derive a reasonable soil profile uh, parameterization uh, for all three maps. And, uh, oops, there is a copy and paste error on this slide. I don't know how that happened. This, this is not supposed to be there. Uh, so if, if we do this, uh, the, um, the uh, <coughs> we, we see that here is a, a cutout of the area on the top. And then, um, so this is the geophysics picks, and as an example here is the soil taxation map. And if we make an average over the, the map units that are present in the soil taxation map, we see that we don't capture the patterns in crop product productivity that are, uh, that are present in the geophysical based uh, soil maps. So, so yes, the, uh, the spatial image that we obtain from standard maps is not so good. We can also look at, at this in a little bit more detail, and and uh, here is a comparison of uh, simulated and and uh, observed LEI again. This time in a scatter plot, 
And yes, we see that our geophysics based soil map here on the left can predict the field average uh, LII better than the other two uh, maps. But you know, critics may say that this other two maps don't look so bad either. And, and yes, I agree with that. So if, if we average actually over the whole regions, the, the improvement is only minor when analyzed, when we do the analysis for all dates and all crops. Uh, but this, this can be easily understood, and this is due to, to the presence of a lot of winter crops in this area. And these winter crops are just much less prone um, to stress because they, uh, they don't grow deep into the summer. <clears throat> So yes, there are only slight improvements for winter crops at the, the kilometer scale when using the geophysics based soil map, but we observed much stronger improvements in summer and also in fields uh, where the soils were highly heterogeneous. So in summary, I would say that, the, that the, this work showed that there really was an added value of geophysics based soil maps at this, this um, one kilometer scale and that image classification of EMI data pr produced high resolution and large scale soil maps uh, that were that we then and that we developed a workflow that allowed us to provide these soil maps with quantitative layer and textural information. And this allowed us to simulate time series of productivity at harvest, stress during the growing season, and it resulted in an LAI, LAI that matched well with uh, with independent satellite ob observations. I think we, you can, I hope you can imagine uh, interesting applications for such a spatial modeling system. For example, it could be used to optimize irrigation for this region or to maximize productivity by changing uh, the field arrangements as, as we are thinking about uh, in Venerop and also to evaluate management practices in general. So as a short outlook to, 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 to open code two, uh, I, I made a slide uh, thinking about uh, what could be the next steps. And I think there are many uh, uh, improvements possible in the area of efficient data acquisition. Uh, one, it would be interesting to, to use more modular devices integrated with tractors so that it, so that it can be, uh, so that we don't have to measure after harvest anymore. So this is kind of a, a vision or a demonstrator that I'm hoping to realize in the open call uh, two uh, period. I think data mining of this type of uh, data is, is still very interesting. Uh, we use the supervised classification uh, approach, but I know in Venerop there are much more people working with remote sensing are much are using much more advanced methods. So it would be interesting to interface with them. The integration with model of course, it's also very interesting data assimilation, multi-source data assimilation, all very promising. And I think there are many interesting applications. And, uh, and one of, only one of them is to think about field arrangements, uh, what is being done in CP5. And this is also the future home of my open call to projects. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I hope we have some time left for questions. Thank you.